Hello, everyone, and welcome to Give and Grow, Jewish Teen Philanthropy's Unique, Powerful and Lasting Impact. This webinar um, gives us the opportunity to delve into our brand new impact report from the Jewish Teen Funders Network. Um, thank you everyone so much for being here. And also a special shout out to our Foundation Board Incubator communities who are here with us today. Um, they were so instrumental um, in this report. Um, data from their communities was, was used as part of it. So we want to say a huge, huge thank you um, to them being here today as well. My name is Danielle Siegel. I'm the Senior Program Manager of the Jewish Teen Funders Network. Jewish Teen, sorry. So welcome everyone. Um, we have a really exciting webinar for you today um, with a couple of special guests too, so we can delve into our brand new impact report. Um, so first of all, for those who are new to the Jewish Teen Funders Network, um, we exist to strengthen Jewish engagement and identity through supporting and elevating the field of Jewish teen philanthropy. And Jewish teen philanthropy is a powerful way for teens to make meaningful action to change the world by giving. And what are we going to be covering today during our webinar? Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to our speakers for today. Um, we're going to be sharing a little bit about the vision of Jewish teen philanthropy. Um, and then delving into our impact report, how and why we did this evaluation and this report. Um, we're gonna delve into some of those key findings. Um, and then we're also gonna look at ways that you can use Give and Grow in your community. So here we have our speakers for today. Uh, Wayne Green, Executive Director of the Jewish Teen Funders Network. Um, you will hear from him in just a little bit. Uh, Jennifer Byers, Senior Research Consultant at ORS Impact. Again, you're going to be hearing a little bit more about her very soon. Um, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Ricky Schechtel. She is the co-founder of the Jewish Teen Funders Network. Uh, Ricky Schechtel is a Barnard graduate and former marketing executive. Her philanthropic interests focus on Israel, education and Jewish identity, both nationally and internationally. Uh, currently, she is the chair of the International Marketing Committee of Beit Hapford Soft. Uh, she is a founding partner of PELIE, the Partnership for Effective Leadership and Innovative Education, and JTFN, the Jewish Teen Funders Network. Uh, she's a member of the JFN board from 2003 to 2010, and Ricky served as the Jewish Funders Network board chair from 2006 to 2008. Um, Ricky also founded JCYF, which is the Jewish Community Youth Foundation of Princeton, which is a youth philanthropy program. So I am going to, without further ado, hand over to Ricky um, to kick us off with our webinar. Thank you, Ricky. My pleasure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Great to sort of see you right now for some reason. All I can see is Danielle on my screen, but that's okay. Ah, much better. Good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to see all of you. Um, so I am hold the unique uh, title of being the co-founder of JTFN. My partner, Barbara Lubran, has since moved on. And when I sit here and I look at all of you and people who are still interested in this topic and still want to talk about this topic 14 years later, I'm quite thrilled to see where we are because the JTFN came out of a, uh, a JFN conference where we did a parallel conference back in Denver in 2006 for about 100 kids around the country who were interested in Jewish youth philanthropy. And at the time, Barbara was running a program in Washington, D.C., and I was funding a program in Princeton and running that. And uh, we thought, we need to really take this and run with it. We need to really elevate this entire profession and elevate this entire world because we saw the enthusiasm and we saw the way the kids were interacting with the adult philanthropists and the energy that came out of all this. And, uh, but the truth is that the roots to JTFN for me personally go back way further. Uh, when my husband and I started our foundation, we wanted our kids who were uh, six, eight, and nine at the time to be interested in what we referred to as the family business. And so we would take them on some site visits and we get a portion of their weekly allowance, had to go to Tzedaka. And then once a year, the three kids would meet and review a couple of small 
proposals and talk about things that were interesting to them. And we left them to decide where the money would go. And one year they looked at something in Israel that we thought was right up their alley and they knew the people who ran the organization and it dealt with kids. And we thought this was something, it was a no brainer, they would definitely fund. And they said, oh, we're not giving them anything. And I was shocked. And I said, why not? And they said, well, look at this brochure. They don't need our money. This is like, this brochure must have cost a lot of money. So why would we give them our money to waste it? So I, I said, I explained to them that I happened to know that the brochure had been donated. And I called the head of the organization and told them this and immediately they put a sticker on because what was really interesting to me was that if an eight year old and a nine year old could see this and I thought, wow, we need these voices at the table. And I thought there's nothing more empowering than telling teenagers that their voices count, their money counts, their opinions count, their thoughts count. You don't need to be, wait to be older. You don't need to wait to have a little more money in your pocket in order to be able to make a difference in the Jewish world. And I found that concept very empowering. And so we started JCYF, the Jewish Community Youth Foundation in Princeton. It's now in its 18th year. We are the only lunatics in the uh, Jewish youth philanthropy space who run 10 boards simultaneously. So hats off to our staff. I see Celeste is here. So hats off to our staff because I don't know how they do it and make the trains all run on time. But um, as a result, we thought it was really important to focus on the professionals and to focus on the field in general. And that's where JTFN came from, was wanting to really um, elevate the profession, elevate the way we approach Jewish youth philanthropy, and to keep in mind that the three words in that little term are equally important because there's lots of youth philanthropy out there. Ke Kellogg, uh, the Kellogg Foundation invented this long before I ever came along, but the Jewish part is what really resonated with me. And um, when FBI started and we decided to have these 10 very different kind of programs, kind of taking the best that we had learned from Jewish philanthropy over the years at JTFN and seeding these programs and putting them together. Um, we talked a lot about at JTFN what FBI could look like and what would be the best kind of result. Because at the, at the end of the day, we want engaged, empowered, experienced teens, and not just for their teenage years, but what's been most interesting once you hear about more about this report and you read through it, is to see how this has impacted their lives as they move beyond their high school years, college and beyond college, um, how this has impacted the way they think about their place in the world, the way they think about how they can make a difference in the world. Um, uh, we find that it, to us, it, it, it feels like a really big home run. It wasn't just an idea or a little engine that could, it actually has changed people's lives and the way they think about themselves as Jews, the way they think about themselves as philanthropists, the way they think about themselves as part of the community. Um, and Celeste and I are always amazed at, we, we've had kids who graduated our program who came back to be madrichim um, in our program. These are kids who work five days a week in New York and would slept back on the train on Sundays, well, not now during COVID, but would slept back on the train on Sundays to work with kids in the program because it had impacted them so greatly. That was amazing to us, but it doesn't just happen in our program. There is another program in JTFN's network that's being run by someone who graduated the Jew Youth, Jewish Youth Philanthropy Program 10 years ago. So those are the kind of stories that we love and those are the kind of stories we like to tell. And this evaluation really gives you the numbers and as well as the anecdotal evidence about how these kinds of programs impact kids. When we, when we started this, we thought of it at the time, back in, way back in the dark ages of 2006, there was a lot of discussion about the different pillars that went into making up your Jewish identity. And you know, there were uh, day school and Jewish camp and, and immersive Jewish experiences. And we felt really strongly that belonging to a Jewish youth philanthropy program should and could be one of those pillars because not only does it give you a grounding in Judaism's approach to philanthropy, to tikkun olam, to gemilut chasidim, but it also gives you a seat at the table way before you think you're ready for it. 
and it gives you that sense of empowerment and belonging and you're going to see that emerge as everyone goes through the evaluation with you today and explains the outcomes. So without further ado, um, welcome to all of you and I give you Wayne Green, our fabulous fearless leader. Thank you so much, Ricky. So um, as you will probably notice, uh, I'm on two screens, so um, unfortunately uh, my computer didn't work, so you can see me uh, and my backdrop that I moved my computer to, uh, but you will um, get a visual of just the, the iPhone that I'm calling in from. So um, thank you, Ricky, for that introduction and providing that background. Uh, what's so incredible about the information we're going to share with you today is the impact that this has had on the teens um, and the communities that have really been affected um, in a positive way by these programs. I'm really thrilled that we have um, an incredible um, evaluating uh, company, ORS, who have been with us from day one. Um, and I'm very excited to be able to introduce you to um, Jennifer. So Danielle, if you just want to um, put the PowerPoint back up for us, please. Thank you. So um, for you, those of you, you would have seen our impact report. Um, just again, this is an incredible document that really outlines the, the key findings from this research. Uh, and we're really going to spend the next 40 minutes talking through um, what these results are. Um, we have this available for you. We can certainly send it out to you again um, after this webinar. So this is an incredible um, visualization about how these stories really have impacted teens and what does it mean for them once they've been through a philanthropy program, how this actually um, has changed their lives um, once they leave the program and move on to college and beyond. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to uh, Jennifer. So Jen is a colleague who I've worked with now for a number of years who comes from ORS Impact. Uh, and she started there in 2005 I've worked, after working at Casey Family Programs. Jen has a bachelor's degree from Wesleyan University in Connecticut and a PhD in clinical psychology from Indiana University. As a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pittsburgh and a research scientist at the University of Washington she honed her skills in the analysis of complex data set and published widely on the influences of families, communities, and culture on youth development. I'm so excited to hand it over to Jen, who's going to talk to us about the report. Okay, you can hear me? All right, thanks so much, Wayne. Um, it's so great to be here with all of you and share the fruits of our work together over the past five years. Um, it's amazing to think about that, that this is the culmination of, of work for so long with, with some of you here. Um, so before I present the results from the Give and Grow Impact Report, I'm going to quickly review the why of evaluation, um, share JTFN's theory of change for this work, and describe the methods that we use to collect the data that we're talking about today. So um, what, I'm gonna review some of the reasons that we do evaluation. Sometimes people do evaluation for the purpose of accountability. And this is actually how most people think of evaluation. Um, it's designed to address questions like, did we accomplish what we said we would? Did we achieve reasonable results? Next slide, please. Um, a second reason that we do evaluation is to demonstrate value, um, to determine the evidence base or value of an effort. So evalu evaluations aimed at demonstrating value address questions like, is it worth the money that it costs? Should it be continued, expanded, cut back, changed, or abandoned? Should the model be replicated? Next slide. So people also invest in evaluation to inform decision making and to strengthen actions in support of greater impact. This is sometimes also known as continuous improvement. Results from evaluation aimed at learning address questions like, how well is the project going? A little bit more about process. How can we improve our efforts? So sometimes referred to as program improvement. Some evaluations are aimed at generating information that can be used to communicate or promote an organization's reputation and influence by demonstrating success. So people who conduct evaluations for this purpose want to use data to tell their story to various audiences, including other potential funders, which can help with the future, with future funding and sustainability. The final purpose is field building, which helps us document effective models to improve or replicate programs. 
For JTFN and the funders of the Foundation Board Incubator, the primary purpose of the broader evaluation was demonstrating the value. So that, um, but the, it was also really important for them to support the marketing of their Jewish Teen Philanthropy Program by local Jewish Teen Program administrators in, in the communities where they were based. And then of course they were interested in building the field of Jewish Teen Philanthropy. Uh, the Give and Grow Impact Report is the culmination of years of work to fulfill these purposes and to help you if you want to grow Jewish teen philanthropy in your community. Thanks. So once um, we worked with, with JTFN staff and the funders to um, agree upon the purpose and audiences, we worked with them to develop a theory of change. So um, what is a theory of change? Some of you are, are probably familiar with this. It's a conceptual model which is often presented as a visual for achieving a collective vision. So it helps groups of people who care about something get aligned on what they're hoping to accomplish with a particular effort and how they're going to accomplish it. It identifies short and long-term outcomes or changes that you'd expect to achieve as a result of your work. Um, so outcomes can be changes, for example, in individuals, in organizations, or communities. Theories of change are often presented in a graphic format, and this can be called an outcome map. Um, but it can also, theories of change can also be presented in narrative form. And they're really helpful for informing evaluation methods and tools, which is what we did in the Give and Grow evaluation. So hopefully um, you can see uh, JTFN's theory of change for the Jewish Teen Philanthropy Program that's incubated in several communities across the globe and is the subject of this Give and Grow evaluation. Um, so just to orient you, the top, at the top are the strategies or activities in which community organizations and participating teens were expected to engage so that they could achieve the intended outcomes. And at the bottom is the aspirational goal for the program, that more, there are more Jewish leaders and change makers throughout the global community. So the outcomes in the top half are the changes among teens that would be expected to happen more immediately through participation in the program. These are also called short-term outcomes. The outcomes in the lower half are longer-term outcomes. So uh, these are changes among teens that are expected a year or more after the program experience. And when you're looking at these kinds of outcome maps, you can think of the arrows, you can translate the arrows into so that. So for example, if you're looking at the outcomes in the top left of the theory change, you would understand this as teens participate in a community's teen, Jewish teen philanthropy program so that they experience increased knowledge of, of and pride in Jewish values and accomplishments worldwide and increased understanding of the Jewish connection, value and obligation to engage in Sadaka so that they experience positive Jewish identity and passion for Judaism so that in the long term they experience increased or sustained positive Jewish identity and involvement in Jewish life community. Um, the other priority short-term outcomes um, are that are denoted by the blue star were increased knowledge and use of leadership skills within the Foundation Board program and increased knowledge um, skills and skills for doing philanthropy and other priority long-term outcomes were increased self-identification as a change maker and increased um, change making local, locally and globally and increased in sustained engagement in philanthropic activity locally and globally. And you heard of some of that um, in what Ricky was saying in her introduction. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so this slide, shows how the theory of change informed the tools that we use to collect the outcome data that is the basis for the give and grow evaluation. So based on the theory of change, we worked with JTN, JTFN staff and reviewed prior relevant research and evaluation to design surveys to measure whether teens were experiencing the intended short-term outcomes. And those were given to all teens participating in the Jewish Teen Philanthropy programs at the end of each program year. We also designed a long-term follow-up survey and interview for a smaller number of teens who gave us permission in their year-end surveys to contact them in the future for this purpose. This kind of mixed method evaluation, mixed because it combines quantitative and qualitative information, um, allows you to assess change over time in teens' ratings on various outcomes, that's the quantitative part, 
And through teens' reflections on their program experience, the qualitative information, it allows you to gain insight on how the program helps teens experience the intended outcomes. So in other words, you can say that we're using these data to test the theory of change. Okay, so the impact report itself is based on data collected from 588 teens who participated in the JTFN funded programs in six communities, um, San Diego, Detroit, Boston, Toronto, Philadelphia, and Melbourne across four program years beginning in 2015. Because the goal of the long-term follow-up was to find out how teens were doing after they had a chance to act on their experience in the program, we sent long-term follow-up surveys only to the teens who had completed the Jewish Teen Philanthropy Program at least a year prior. And we selected teens to participate in the follow-up interviews from the group of teens who completed the long-term follow-up surveys. So in addition to information being th that was collected from participating teens across the first four program years, the impact report is based on long-term follow-up surveys completed by 49 teens who had finished the program um, at least one year pr prior, as well as phone interviews with 21 teens who also completed the long-term follow-up surveys. Now we're ready for the results. Okay, so the subtitle of the impact report is a pithy preview of key findings of the Give and Grow evaluation. Um, the program has a powerful, can you, I, I'm not seeing, can you press the, um, there you go, okay. Uh, the, the program, um, has a powerful and lasting impact that teens attribute to the following unique aspects of their Jewish teen philanthropy program experience. It engages them to think about their Judaism in ways that feel relevant to their lives and dreams for the future. It challenges them to work with Jewish peers and build consensus by pre presenting their views and listening to others and compromising. It empowers them to make decisions that are consequential for communities and issues they care about. And it connects them with change makers in community organizations, exposing them to different issues and career paths that are aligned with Jewish values. Wayne, did you want to um, comment yeah, on I did. anything? Or? Yeah, so, you know, when, when we hear this idea of um, Jewish teen philanthropy engages teens in unique ways that are inspiring and challenging them, to them, uh, it really sort of resonates with this idea about how we think about education for teens um, and this, this way of how um, providing challenge in education is a really fundamental point about how they learn and grow. Uh, and with this, this the information, the data set that you've, um, we've gathered, it, it really is about empowering teens at all levels of Jewish engagement to serve as philanthropic leaders um, grounded in their Jewish identity um, and values that they get through these ins inspirations and challenges by connecting to the community, by looking at ways to connect to their peers um, and to think about Judaism in a way that feels relevant to them. Uh, I think one of the key pieces um, about this is, you know, how you've presented and the, the research has shown that the ability to provide challenge um, and empowerment are crucial uh, components of um, educational practices in programming. Uh, which ultimately supports their understanding of how they um, aim to be inspired. Uh, and so it's really exciting that um, the data really emphasizes this uh, way that how we think about Judaism is reflected in a way that is relevant to the teens today. Yeah, for sure. And, and another thing I just really want to drive home, you know, I was, I had the privilege of doing a lot of these phone interviews with the teens and they they repeatedly more several of them um besides besides just describing these aspects of the programs that are so powerful for them they really emphasized how unique this was experience this experience was in their own life so to to be given this kind of um decision making power and and to uh be able to pursue their passions in ways that they had, hadn't done before and hadn't had the opportunity before. So, you know, this is a big investment of their time. Th this mm -hmm. is a, the program, I don't know how much people know about, everybody knows about this program itself, but you know, it's eight or nine months long, weekly, um, 
meetings that are long, some t in between stuff. Um, and, and, but for them, um, it was worth it because it was unique. Um, the other thing I'll just add um, is that for those on the call is that Jen actually was one of the people who did a lot of the calls, if not all of them, I, you may have had some other, but Jen was actually speaking to the team. So I think it's really uh, fantastic that we have someone who really understands this work from having the direct contact with those that she spoke to during the process. Okay, you could go to the next slide. So, um, so the, the second key finding is related to the power of the program, which is reflected in the strength, the, in strength in Jewish identities and senses of connection to the Jewish community, um, um, among other things. So the first part of this is that this means that at the end of the program, compared to before the, before the program, teens reported on the surveys stronger agreement with statements like, being Jewish is an important part of who I am, I feel connected to Jewish people around the world, being involved in the Jewish community is important to me, and many or most of my values are Jewish values. These are just a sample, a, a selection of some of the things that they were asked. And um, I just wanna note that this finding is especially impressive because the program tends to attract teens that, are, that already have Jewish identities and senses of connection to the Jewish community that are quite strong. So even though they start out strong, they end up stronger to agree that was statistically significant, which means it's very unlikely that th what we observed through the data is due to chance or measurement error. We also found that a year and a half or more later, 71% of teens who were interviewed reported that their experience in the program strengthened their Jewish identity, which they most commonly attributed to strengthening their sense, appreciation, or understanding of the Jewish community or their place in it. Okay. The Before, the sorry, I just want to oh. do, um, yeah, so I just want to do, um, add some, some comment there um, on this, Jen. You know, one of the pieces that um, I think is really powerful here is this idea of, um, and as you mentioned, of being um, statistically significant about this connection about strengthening Jewish identity. Uh, and, you know, for those who um, have read the, the full impact report and, and potentially also the the longer um, full evaluation, you know, the alumni stayed involved in um, these concepts of Jewish rituals and community more than a year after participating in the program. And I think it's really powerful to know that those who participate in programs such as the, the youth programming, uh, the Jewish uh, youth philanthropy programs in different parts of the Foundation Board Incubator really demonstrated this commitment and understanding of having this embedded Jewish um, strengthened identity as they move from the program finishing into college. Um, you know, in this uh, data set too, we also explored um, server items, also explored um, issues around Jewish rituals. So things like celebrating, observing annual Jewish holidays, attending services, um, looking at how they celebrate um, Shabbat and attending services for Shabbat. Um, our survey also um, explored items around what does it mean to think about involvement in Jewish community? And I, um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more about that. And it talks about, you know, we explored issues around activities that bring Jews together primarily to learn, primarily to celebrate Jewish culture, um, other activities that bring Jews together to make changes in the lives of other Jews um, that they were engaged with, um, as well as making changes to the lives of others locally um, and to make changes to the lives of others globally. Um, and I think what's really powerful is that the study really um, takes credit from the, this experience of being part of a philanthropy board that really strengthened their sense of appreciation and understanding of the Jewish community and how it placed them uh, to really strengthen their Jewish values as part of this program. Okay, thanks. So the power of the program is also reflected in how it inspires and fosters the next generation of leaders and change makers. So this chart shows the average percentage of teens who reported at the end of their program experience that they experienced at least a moderate increase in different leadership skills. This especially strong finding related to consensus, consensus building was underscored in the long term follow up interviews where several teens shared how much they valued the consensus consensus building skills in particular, and how those skills strengthen the contributions they were able to make within new change making activities in which they'd engaged after the Jewish Teen Philanthropy Program. This came up over and over in the interviews. 
how much they valued that particular thing and how relevant it was to um, everything they wanted to do, both as change makers in kind of volunteer capacities and then also um, in their in their budding professional lives. Yeah, you know, Jen, as you were speaking, I think the, the key phrase that I heard in that was this idea of new change making, uh, because really this report is about alumni. It's understanding um, teens who participated in a program and then what actually happened to them when they finished the program. What were the skills, contributions, values that they actually applied um, as they moved through different points of their lives? And so this ability to really engage in uh, issues that talk about how they learn consensus building, skills for working in a group, taking on leadership role, active listening and public speaking are really fundamental skills that these teens are ga gaining from their program and are able to be applicable in, in, and transferable to other aspects of Jewish and communal life. Um, and I think that's so critical to why these programs are so powerful to what it means to the teens when they're actually participating. And then for us to really show that this is a skill set that they take on to other aspects about what they do. Um, and, you know, Ricky sort of said it um, really beautifully at the beginning about, you know, this is about teens who they participate in the program. And then when we see the impact that's been had on those teens when a year, 10 years later, she mentioned, um, you know, it's really powerful to understand what they gain in the program and how they actually stay with them moving on to other experiences. Okay. So you can press it again, Danielle. Okay. Oh. So, um, and then finally, by following up with teens at least a year and a half after participating in the program, we were able to learn that positive impacts on participants' Jewish identity and connection to the Jewish community last well beyond the end of the program. And participants also continue to be highly motivated to become leaders and change makers as they begin their adult lives. Um, and one particularly interesting finding that, that Wayne started to speak to a little bit um, that I think really spoke to the staying power of the changes of that change, the staying power of the changes teens experience was a difference we observed between past participants who still lived at home with their families and those who are no longer living at home when we check back in with them more than a year and a more than a year after participating in the program. So this, we found that those who were still living with their families were still as involved in Jewish rituals, such as observing Shabbat and attending services, had as strong Jewish identities and as strong senses of connection to the Jewish community as they had when they finished the program. Whereas those who are no longer living with their families had as strong Jewish identities and senses of connection to the Jewish community, even, even though they were involved in Jewish rituals significantly less. Um, so I think this finding offers assurance that even if teens participate less in formal Jewish rituals after they leave home, they can still maintain strengthened Jewish identities and connections to the Jewish community as they navigate their transition from uh, childhood to young adulthood. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really critical piece, Jen, because one of the key pieces is that if teens leave home, they go to college, they may not be participating as much as they did in some rituals that we talked earlier with their families. But the fundamental core piece about what happens is they continue to remain really connected to community and that their Jewish values are really strong in how they navigate through college life and beyond. So I think that's a really a critical piece. The other really interesting thing too from um, the data that we had um, and, and how we kind of thought about Jewish identity, which I really want to share with people about you know, Jewish identity can mean a number of things. And so for us in our survey um, and in our evaluation, it meant being Jewish is an important part of who I am. Being involved in the Jewish community is important to me. Connecting with other Jewish, pe other Jewish people is important to me. My Jewish heritage is important to me. Many or most of my values are Jewish values. I feel connected to, Jewish, to my Jewish heritage. I feel connected to the Jewish community and I feel connected to Jewish people around the world. Um, and so I think it's really critical that when we look at that, we, we really take in the, the scope of what it means for these young uh, teens participating in the program, but what, what it means for them to experience Jewish identity. And when we think about, you know, this other lasting impact, you clearly have it there about being change makers. I mean, one of the, the key pieces about this is that they, um, you know, self-identified as change makers and were poised to continue to engage or were actively engaging 
in change making activities locally and globally. Um, and the teens through the evaluation really attributed their decision to engage in meaningful change making efforts as a result of being part of uh, one of these boards. So it's really exciting that we can see that the alumni who participate in these programs really are having lasting impact and effect not just staying power by being in the program, but what it actually means to them when they actually move on and participate outside um, well into college. So I'm gonna hand it over now to um, my colleague, Danielle, who's just gonna to talk to you a little bit more about um, using Give and Grow in your community. Uh, and then we're gonna have a time for us to ask some more questions at the end. So if you do have questions, feel free to add them into the chat box. And we'll make sure to get to them uh, before the end of our uh, session today. So I'm gonna hand it over to Danielle. Wonderful, thank you so much, Wayne and Jennifer for walking us through some of that really important data. And there is a lot there. Um, so what, what can we do with all this data? How can we use this report to really help our own programs, advocate for our own programs, um, and really lift up the, the field of Jewish youth philanthropy? So, so really, the the first check-in is can this data inform our own programming um, maybe this data will change how we view our own programs um, any changes that we would like to make in response um, maybe this is a um, awakening about our alumni and how we might be connecting um, with those alumni of the program um, and how does this data validate what we what we're doing um, i think we've known for a while that this field is valid and important. And when we're talking to others about this field, um, now we have the data to validate it and, and, and back it up. And there's always been a certain amount of data. Um, and this long term, um, this long term impact report can really add to that and really strengthen um, the narrative that that we are telling. Um, there is a lot of data in here. Um, so really looking at it and curating the information according to your audience, according to who you would like to, to give this information to. Um, think about those who have a stake in your program um, and why this program is so critical. We've seen from the data how important it is for decision making, for long term impact, for continuing to be change makers, for strengthening uh, Jewish community and for being a stronger link in that Jewish community chain. Um, so thinking about who wants, who is it important to hear those messages about how vital really this program is. Um, there are lots of different um, audience members who you might want to share this with. Um, could be funders, um, community leaders, um, parents, families, the teens themselves, and also other youth professionals. Um, so thinking about um, how do we show the critical nature of this program? Is it showing the parents some of those quotes that are included in the report, which offer a really wonderful narrative backing for some of the data? Um, is it showing other youth professionals so that you can collaborate and work with them more, uh, exploring crossover programming. Um, is it the community leaders? Um, do we want to showcase to the other community leaders just how critical this program is and what wonderful effects it is having after the fact? Um, so these are all different, um, different people that you can share this report with. But the main thing is really what, what is important to you to share? What have you acknowledged as a, as a key point of your Jewish teen philanthropy program and how you want to share that message? Um, social media is a great way to get the word out about your program and or this report. And this, um, this report is also, it's online. So as we shared at the beginning, you can flick through it, you can have a look through the whole report. Um, you might also have a community newsletter, which you want to share about your own program and use this data as a backing. Um, this is a key moment of being an advocate for the program and the importance of teen philanthropy 
right now. We know that we're going through an incredibly strange time and we have seen the amazing impact that Jewish teen philanthropy has had during this, um, you know, during this time of COVID, for instance, that the programs continued online, even though they couldn't meet in person. Um, it's so crucial for supporting the infrastructure of the Jewish community, both local and globally. Um, there are so many positives that have come out of what is a rather difficult situation. Um, so advocating for that in any kind of community use letter, using this as a vacuum can also really help. Um, and lastly, what data stands out to you? as a reader, as a consumer of this. Um, as I said, there's a lot of data in here. So was there a particular data point, a particular quote, a particular statistic that really resonated with you? Um, you know your community better than anybody else. So if it stood out and resonated for you, then it might also resonate with others in your community who really wanna hear more about it. So um, I am now going to um, hand back over to Wayne um, to address any questions that we have um, from our group here. Um, if you have any questions <coughs> at all, please write them in the chat box um, and we will um, try and get through a couple uh, before we have to close off today um, so that we can kind of hear from you and your thoughts and any questions that you may have. Um, so Wayne, I am going to hand back over to you. Thanks, Danielle. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, look, I have uh, one question that I'm really uh, curious to ask, Jen, and that really is about the fact that you were very much engaged in this work and you were speaking with um, teens directly. Uh, what, what, what did you hear? What surprised you by doing those um, interviews? Is there, can you share with us the experience of what it was like to actually speak directly to the teens to ask about this program? Sure. Thanks, Wayne. Um, I've, I've personally found it very touching to talk to these young people. Um, I have two young boys um, and um, I found myself just so inspired by what they were saying about the impact that this experience had on their life and found myself just hoping that the Seattle um, the, the Seattle Teen Foundation Board program still existed when when my son, my younger son, who's more of a joiner, um, is is of age. Um, I'm a I'm a prideful but not very uh, not practice practicing much Jew, and I would love him to have that experience of um, it's just such a breath of benefit from the Jewish aspect to the um, to the skills and the social consciousness. Um, so it's just, it's, it, I just found myself wishing that as, as I was listening to these young people that it was still around for my own child. <laughs> um, well, the, the program in Seattle is going really well. So I'm, I'm very confident that it'll be there in, in many years time for, for your son to join. Jen, can you tell me, you know, you spoke to the teens um, and you were inspired by them. Was there anything that you heard that surprised you or things that you were sort of wowed by? Do you know, was there any... I mean, I, I, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised by this, but um, it was just, it was really heartening to hear how kind of at the same time as they were talking about how hard it was to kind of the, the, one, the ones that we talked to that were away from home and, and, and in college, most of them um, talked about the challenges of staying connected to their Judaism, but they, but so many of them were d doing just that. Um, they, they were putting in the extra effort to, you know, um, participate in Hillel or just, um, maintain that connection by, um, drawing on their Jewish values. It just, one of the things that was really interesting is how the program just really kind of operationalized their Jewish values for them. So it made them like, it gave them an experience to apply to apply them. And I think that helped them um, realize they could apply them in different ways. You know, that mm -hmm. it wasn't just this, this theoretical thing that they share with their family or other Jews that it was, it was, it's, it's like a, it's a lens. It's a, it's a helpful lens. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I have a, um, a question someone um, that has sent to me um, and they just wanted to ask if you can just elaborate a little bit more about the, 
the data point where you talked about teens, um, you know, the rituals being at home versus being um, at college and how, what the changes were, if you can just talk about that a little bit more. Um, so just, it, yeah, it's kind of a complicated finding because it, it's basically, you know, dividing the um, teens by whether they were someone who still lived at home at the time of the long-term follow-up or someone who didn't live at home at the time of the long-term follow-up. And mm -hmm. what, what we saw is that, you know, one of the, as you saw in the theory of change, one of the goals is that, that um, once youth teens leave the program, that they maintain the gains that they, that they had. And um, because we, for, for some of these outcomes, you know, we had, we had it at multiple time points. So, this is one thing I didn't really talk about that much, but in the year end survey, we also collected the, the base, their baseline for some of these outcomes. And then, so we had two time points for several of the outcomes at the, the at the year end survey, there was the, like the baseline where they were at the end of the program. And then um, in the long-term follow-up, it was where they were now. Right. So we could mm -hmm. look at change over time. And um, what we found is that whereas you know, people were still at kids who were still at home. Teens, they they were they maintained on average. So it was like flat for Jewish connection, Jewish identity, and practice of Jewish rituals. Whereas with the te the teens who were away from home, they they dropped on the Jewish rituals, but they maintained on the identity and the connection. Mm -hmm. So, um, did that answer the question? Yeah, that did. My hand uh, motion. So. If the person who, if you can raise your hand if you want any more information. Yeah, look, that, that's helpful to understand. I mean, I think what's really critical is kind of having that, that understanding of sort of looking at those teens that were still at home or ones that have moved out from college and also understanding the, the data points of when you can actually um, think about the fact that we had teens who participated, we did the evaluation at the end of that program year. And then there was a, a reflection point that you can actually go back to when you interviewed them or um, did follow up surveys with them a year or two years later. Um, so I appreciate that uh, that was added. Um, I'll just see what other questions that I got sent were. Um, I, another question um, was just about the fact that um, the theory of change was interesting to see um, and how critical was that to have ahead of, um, you know, how, how did you come up with those points um, to get to this evaluation? Well, I think theory of change, it's so critical. We, um, and, and, and what we like to say is that the process is just as important as the product. So we had the um, pleasure of, of meeting in person with the then ED, Brianna, and, um, and uh, the funders, some of the funders. And um, I think there were other staff, but it was a pretty small group. But, but we go through, we facilitate a process where people, we um, usually start out with like a, a rough draft from based on the um, literature that the client provides us about the program. And then we, we all figure out um, what are the short and long-term changes that they want to see. And it's an iterative process. And, um, you know, there are lots of, of, of healthy discussions about, no, that, I, don't, I don't think that's it. What about this? Um, and then people were finding it together. And, and, and the result is that all of a sudden, like people are, can, they can row in the same direction, like a crew boat, you know. And sometimes, like uh, we ran with the with the with the theory of change to um, inform what outcomes we measured, and we work with them to prioritize which outcomes they want to measure for the evaluation, um, mm -hmm. because you can't, you know, you can't measure everything. It's too much burdensome for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. um, but it also sometimes what a theory of change can can lift up for, for people is what, what else they want to change in their activities. So if you realize sometimes people will go through this process and they'll generate the outcomes they care about and then they'll look back up at the activities and realize like, oh, are we really doing enough if we want to achieve this outcome? And it can mm -hmm. actually help with 
planning, um, strategic planning, um, or just program improvement and things like that. Just, just even that process before you collect any data. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Jen. Um, we're um, out of time for questions, but I think it's really helpful for people to understand that the theory of change is really critical to help inform what is decided around what we evaluate um, and really trying to understand the outcomes that we're aiming to, to achieve. So I'm going to hand it over to Danielle just to close us out um, uh, and to say thank you to everyone. This is going to be available um, to be viewed um, and shared. Uh, so thank you for your time and to Danielle just to make some closing announcements quickly. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, just a couple of announcements um, before we say goodbye. Um, we have a session tomorrow. It is our Youth Philanthropy Online Build It session. Um, it is a hands-on workshop in some of the great tools that we introduced last week, including um, Google Slides, Jamboards, Flippities, Padlets, you name it. So it's going to be a very interactive workshop. Come with your half-made resources and we will workshop and help you actually make them. Um, so that's going to be tomorrow. Uh, next week, we have a wonderful um, webinar called Ask Rabbi Sachs. This is an amazing opportunity and the office of Rabbi Sachs um, has been combining with this incredible technology um, that was used to capture um, testimony from Holocaust survivors um, where there is a giant data bank of questions and answers and that a user can interact with it like you're having a conversation with Rabbi Sachs. So this is a wonderful partnership. We're very excited. There's going to be a webinar all about it next week. And particularly, we're looking for um, suggestions of what questions about philanthropy and Judaism and identity that we can add to this question bank. So don't miss out. Really rare, wonderful opportunity next Monday. Um, also, just to let you know that our applications are now open for our opening the door, spelt D-O-R, uh, so the word generation in Hebrew. Um, for our opening the door, it is our grandparent intergenerational program. It is available to any uh, Jewish teen philanthropy program that has returning teens. Um, so please check out the website, jtfn.org forward slash opening the door, door spelt D-O-R, for more information um, about how you can apply and what you can gain from doing that program. Um, so last but not least, huge, huge thank you um, to Jen for joining us today, for Ricky who introduced everything so beautifully at the beginning, um, the whole JTFN team, and you all for being here again, especially to our Foundation Board Incubator communities who were so vital um, for um, our research and our data. Um, so thank you everybody so much and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Bye everyone.